All right, everybody, welcome back to another exciting edition of Kinesiology 3335. So today, what we'll be talking about is issues of discrimination. And we're going to be talking about from a hiring, promotion, termination, comp and compensation standpoint. And with this chapter, it's very important because at some point, it's very likely that whatever industry each of you go into you're going to confront issues involving discrimination, whether that's from a managerial standpoint where you're going to be making hiring, promotion, or termination decisions, or from an employee standpoint where you might be um, evaluated for hiring or promotion or termination, and there could be the potential for employers to consider impermissible aspects for your promotion or your discipline. So, of course... Um, major issues that do come up involving discrimination is when someone or a decision is made by someone based on another person's race or their national origin or potentially someone with a disability. But these are impermissible sort of um, considerations by, by managers. Instead, a person's uh, the, the consideration for hiring or promotion or termination should be on objective uh, merits and things like that. So the most relevant statutes that us as sport managers are impacted by are Title VII, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. So Title VII is part of the, the a, a landmark uh, set of laws that were enacted during the Civil Rights era, and it's, it's called the Civil Rights Act. Um, Title IX, of course, we've all heard of Title IX, virtually everybody, uh, and that was actually um, passed by the federal government in 1972, and that was uh, supposed to be on the basis of equal funding of, in terms of education, uh, no gender discrimination. Of course, we now know that that's bled uh, very drastically into um, athletics because that has been connected to uh, uh, academics. But for our purposes here, Title IX and gender equity um, can be something that comes up involved with hiring or firing, um, promotion or discipline, uh, access to uh, facilities, as well as testing and other sorts of benefits. Uh, we also have the Age uh, Discrimination and Employment Act, which was passed in 1967, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was initially passed in 1973, but has been um, reauthorized by the federal legislature in various capacities over the last uh, 30 to 40 years. And because a growing uh, amount of the population in the United States does have some sort of qualified disability, uh, over 20% of the population has some sort of qualified disability, this is also something that's important for us as sport managers to understand. Now, in addition to the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, Title IX and Title VII. We also have the Equal Pay Act, which we'll talk about at the end. And the Equal Pay Act really focuses on sex discrimination in pay. Uh, and what we're talking about here is where both individuals of different genders are performing essentially the same job uh, dis uh, description at the same institution or the same organization. So it could be a situation where they get a difference in pay in seniority or their differences in some sort of uh, everyday uh, paycheck. But traditionally, the Equal Pay Act says that you should be compensated the same for equal work. And we'll, get, we'll come back to that at the end of the chapter. Now, getting back to employment discrimination, that really is defined as the consideration by an employer of a, of a potential employee or a currently employed employee by anything that is not on the basis of a legitimate job-related factor. So instead of considering someone's abilities objectively, um, instead they're actually making subjective or false assumptions based on stereotypes or some sort of prejudice. And it's any sort of employment decision. So it could be hiring or firing 
or discipline. Um, so any way that there's a failure to uh, make considerations based on the essential factors that are related to the job. So are you going to hire someone on the basis of their education actually qualifying them to work in athletics as an athletic trainer? Or do you want to hire a male because you think that males make better athletic trainers? Now, one is subjective. If they've got the actual education to be a competent, potentially a competent athletic trainer, that's one job-related qualification and one job-related factor versus something that is a subjective stereotype uh, or a prejudice based off of your own subjective beliefs that are not founded on a job-related factor, such as someone's gender. So that is just a, a quick example. And again, when we're talking about prejudice, we're talking about someone's belief that um, they have some sort of unfounded notions. But discrimination is taking the step, one step further where they actually apply their prejudice in um, some sort of uh, employment-related uh, decision. So you choose not to hire someone because of their race, or you fire someone because of their age, or their religion, or their disability. And it's not on the basis of a legitimate job-related uh, factor, but instead it's a naked belief that's something that is uh, pursuant to their um, immutable characteristics. It's something that they cannot control. So, for example, we cannot control race, our own race, our sex, unless we go to drastic measures, our age, our religion for the most part, and whether or not we've got a disability. So it goes back to public policy that we want to protect people from being discriminated against on the basis of things that we really have no control over. So Title VII, again, was passed in 1964, and it applies to protected characteristics, race, religion, national origin. National origin is where sort of your ancestry is versus your race's uh, sort of uh, your ethnic makeup, um, the, the color of your skin. Uh, however, uh, Title VII uh, at this point does not cover sexual orientation or gender identity, uh, although it should be noted that about 30, more than 30 states go the extra step of protecting sexual orientation, and now some also protect gender identity, uh, transgendered people. So going back to our Chapter 3 lesson on how the legal system works in our civics lesson, the differences between state and federal government. Federal laws are the law of the land. And if the federal law, if federal law and state law are inconsistent, so for example, a federal, federal law says you cannot discriminate someone based on their race, and state law says you can, then state law would be trumped by federal law because of the supremacy clause of the Constitution. However, if we kind of shade, uh, change the, the, the fact pattern here and we say that federal law says race, color, religion, sex, national origin are the only protected characteristics where you can't make a hiring or firing decision based off of those characteristics, Fed, uh, if federal law is silent on gender or uh, gender identity, state law could fill in that gap and say, well, we also want to protect these other other classifications and say that they cannot be the basis of a, of a work-related decision. So the state government can actually pass laws that go beyond what the federal government says so long as it's not um, somehow contradicting the federal government. The federal government is just silent on that. So in addition to these being protected classes, the Civil Rights Act, Title VII, says that employers of 15 or more uh, employers who have 15 or more employees uh, and employ them for 20, at least 20 weeks or more are covered by Title VII, uh, and it's administered by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Now, that doesn't mean that if you've got 15, less than 15 employers or you employ 15 or more employers for less than 20 weeks, you can't engage in 
uh, naked discrimination against your employees because we know that many sport organizations or amusement parks are seasonal and they might run for less than 20 week, weeks or they might employ less than 14, 15 people. That just means that f the, Title Seven doesn't apply, but uh, there could be some sort of case law, some judge-made law that has created precedent that, that provides someone who's discriminated on the basis of one of these classifications, a cause of action. Remember stare decisis and case law. Go back to chapter three in week in for a refresher or check the lecture on chapter three if you've got any questions. So Title Seven, again, it applies to any sort of discrimination, which is um, consideration of someone that's uh, not based on an employ on a job related qualification or a aspect. And you're going to be hiring or firing them, uh, laying them off, de de uh, denying them job training, etc., based off of an, un, um, an unpermissible characteristic. However, it does not apply on its face to independent contractors because they are exempt uh, un under prevailing law. So, again, if I am going to give training to someone in my organization, um, but deny another person based on their religion or based off of their race, that is an impermissible reason to not give them this or not uh, give them training and therefore would be a violation of Title VII. Now, some of the, the remedies here involve back pay, which is if you've denied them money, you get they will get it back. Front pay, if they're entitled to the money right away, um, they get that. Or if they've been fired or discharged, um, due to an impermissible uh, consideration, they would get reinstatement, or et cetera, et cetera. So here are some of the uh, different remedies that are uh, that someone who has been uh, injured due to discrimination in the workplace would get. So then, okay, how do we really prove that someone has made a dis a decision uh, that has been impermissible? Uh, based on an impermissible classification or consideration, and thereby, thereby violated Title VII. Well, case law tells us that there's two separate methods to test uh, whether or not someone's committed employment discrimination. The first test is called disparate treatment, and this is intentional discrimination or discrimination on its face. And it's where individuals in similar situations are treated differently due to someone's age or race or, or uh, religion, sex, national origin. Um, and it's proved through direct evidence. So um, we'll, I'll give you an example very shortly of how you would prove direct evidence. Now, disparate treatment is sort of discrimination on its face. Disparate impact is where the employer uses some sort of neutral criteria but the neutral criteria actually ends up discriminating against a certain class of people because it impacts a, a certain group of people disproportionately. So there's no, there doesn't need to be any intent to discriminate, discriminate against a group of people, but instead at the impact actually ends up um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, impacting more people. So an example of di uh, disparate treatment, direct intentional discrimination, would be if you could introduce testimony or evidence of what someone said or what someone wrote as a reason why you're not hiring someone or not promoting them. So for example, a case mentioned in the textbook says, hell that the, defend that the um, athletic director... Uh, was was quoted as saying, hell will freeze over before a woman coaches a boys basketball team. And so here you've got direct evidence from the hiring decision maker's mouth that he's c considering someone's qualifications for a position not based on reasonable criteria, but instead the belief that a, a female is not qualified to coach a boys basketball team. So, on its face, it's discrimination. 
inference is a little bit more nuanced. Here, the actual um, the, the policy is facially neutral, but it has a discriminatory effect. So um, the, the classic sort of discrimination by inference is where if you've got an employer who hands out a test to potential employees and a disproportionate amount of a population that's a protected class ends up performing worse than another group. So let's say a disproportionate a disproportionate amount of Middle Eastern people are impacted by that test um, and they perform poor, more poorly and therefore are not uh, able to uh, get hired or promoted. That would be disparate impact and that's proved by the McDonnell Douglas test. So case law gives us this test that shows uh, for disparate treatment the plaintiff must show that the applicant was a member of a protected class, meaning that they uh, are that they have a specific race or national origin, etc. That the applicant applied for a job in which an employer was seeking potential applicants. You know, there's a job announcement out there, a formal job announcement that the applicant was qualified to perform the job objectively, they had the necessary qualifications, but despite those qualifications, he or she was not hired. And instead, and after that person was denied, the employer either hired someone with lesser qualifications of a different race or someone with a different national origin, or someone actually hired someone that was less than qualified. So either someone with the same qualifications or less qualifications. And based off of the evidence here, um, for, di for disparate, disparate treatment, you could have evidence that the person was just as qualified and the only difference between the two was their race or their gender. Or you could have a situation where, um, for disparate treatment, you actually have direct evidence. So again, it's saying, I'm not hiring you because you're a, a, a female or because you're from this part of the country, or I don't like uh, people of this religion. But if the, employer, if the employer is able to actually provide a reason that's legitimate and non-discriminatory, then they might actually survive this, this McDonnell Douglas test. So you've got how it works is the plaintiff in a discrimination lawsuit is going to try to meet the basic burden to show that he or she was qualified, they applied for a job that was out there, they were denied, and someone else with less qualifications or equal qualifications got the job. Or it could be if they were, pro you know, for a promotion. Then the burden shifts to the employer, and the employer must provide what's called a, a bona fide uh, occupational uh, non-discriminatory reason for um, why that person was not hired. So there needs to be a qualification that has cl a clear criteria that does not have some sort of discriminatory element to it. So for example, let's say that it, it was a job in a warehouse where the employer needed to, or uh, that the employee needed to be able to lift 100 pounds or 50 pounds, and the plaintiff is not someone is someone who could not do that. That potentially could be a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. If that's the case, then the burden would shift back from the defendant to the plaintiff, and the plaintiff would then say, "Well, no, that's actually pretextual. That's just a lie for discriminant in that they really didn't want." To didn't want to hire me because there's high lows that they that they can use at the warehouse and I could just easily learn to use the high low and there the defendant would potentially be liable now for disparate impact again this is where there's seemingly neutral employment practices and that it disproportionately impacts a protected class 
So like I said, employment tests are a relevant example. And all the plant needs to do is statistically prove that the neutral employment practice actually impacts disproportionately a protected class. And then there's, once that happens, the defendant must prove that actually the employment practice is necessary, it's required, and that it achieves a specific objective. In Wynn versus Columbus Municipal Separate School District, we had a plaintiff who was a female who applied for a job as athletic director. However, although she had 20 years of experience working in athletics, mostly in administration, she did not have the other experience that was seemingly necessary for this job because the athletic director traditionally had also been the head football coach. Ultimately, she was not hired despite her years of experience in the athletic department and it went to a male who had been the assistant football coach and then the head football coach. So she, fa she sued on the basis of discrimination. She said that I was qualified for the job, I, I was a female, and I was not hired because someone with lesser experience was hired and the only difference between us was that I'm a female and he's a male. However, the court did not buy her explanation. Uh, instead, the court said that she failed to establish a causal connection between the requirement that the athletic director also serve as head football coach and any actual effect of excluding a disproportionate number of members of the protected class from employment opportunities here being females. So she didn't do a good job under disparate impact analysis showing that the fact that not many women serve as football coaches was the reason why this policy was, uh, was, uh, was a violation of discrimination law. So she wasn't able to show that a disproportionate amount of females are impacted by this uh, in terms of people who um, apply for the job. So, but this is also an example of a case where the plaintiff tried to uh, tried to assert the theory of, of disparate impact. So, like I said, the bona fide uh, the, the bona fide occupational qualification can be used by a plaint by the defendant uh, if the presumption of a, of uh, disparate treatment or disparate impact discrimination is created by a plaintiff. Now, oftentimes the BFOQ is used as a defense for allegations of gender discrimination. Um, and just that means that the discrimination was justified based off of particular requirements of the job. So we've got the Philadelphia fanatic on the left there. So if a specific set of people end up being excluded from this job, um, the employer needs to show a compelling, reasonable um, answer for why, you know, women cannot be the Philadelphia fanatic. Or there was a case involving the um, Phoenix Suns where a female uh, was, or actually I believe it was a male, was kicked off the team because the person could was not able to be athletic enough for the uh, the 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 spirit squad, but that was not a BFOQ in the eyes of the court, and the case actually ended up being settled for about eighty two thousand uh, dollars. Oftentimes, the BFOQ defense is made on basis of gender for men who want to work uh, in athletic clubs and be a, a female um, locker room attendant. Uh, but this, although it might seem like a reasonable uh, BFOQ for the club that they don't want males in the female locker room, sometimes this this rationale is not always successful. So let's talk about something that jumps off the page a bit more. A few years ago, we had Chris Cluey, who at the time was a punter for the Minnesota Vikings. And he had come out 
uh, and been very vocal on behalf of the LGBT community in their pursuit of the marriage equality, that, uh, that people who are gay or lesbian should have the same rights as uh, people who are straight uh, in terms of getting the full benefit of under the law of marriage, uh, in terms of who they marry. And he'd been very vocal. And uh, not that long after he had made the rounds on the local uh, television networks to voice his support, he was actually fired. He was released by the Minnesota Vikings. And they said that he was his performance had suffered uh, throughout the year, and that was the reason why he was fired. However, Cluey penned an article that was released and published on the website Deadspin saying he actually was fired. He was released not because his performance had suffered, but instead it was because he had been vocal and supportive of gay marriage. Now, he provided evidence saying that he compared his stats with um, the year he was fired with the previous years that he was on the team as well as the person that Cluey was replaced by. And it showed that Cluey actually performed better than those people and, and him in subsequent years. Prior, I'm sorry, in, pri in prior years. So let's say that Cluey actually filed a, discri a, a discrimination lawsuit against the Vikings. Minnesota is a state where sexual orientation or gender identity is a protected class. Now let's say we're kind of making, a, we're kind of bending the rules a little bit here, but if it turns out that Cluey and was was uh, a member of the LGBT community, and he he potentially could have made the argument that he was fired on the basis of a protected class, if he can prove that he was fired because not not due to any suffering of his performance, but instead it was due to him having some affiliation with the LGBT community. So it would be that he suffered an adverse employment action, he was fired, and that the person they brought on was actually performed worse than him, and the only difference between the punter that was hired and Cluey was that the punter did not say whether or not he was a member of the LGBT community. So that would be a potential example uh, of this playing out in, in the sport realm. So now we move on to the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. And the ADEA protects employees who are over the age of 40. And there's no limit to the age. Uh, the, there's no cap on, on how old you can be after the age of 40 in order to fall under the protection of the ADEA. So it's if an employer fails or refuses to hire or actually ends up discharging someone who is over the age of 40, and are discriminated on the basis of their age. So it has, you can't, there's no other difference in terms of the person that was brought in and the person that was fired except for their age. However, it should also be known that there's no discrimination against someone, uh, there's no protection for discrimination based on being too young. And this applies to American Indian tribes, religious organizations, and private memberships, unlike Title VII, where uh, private memberships are not covered under um, Title VII. So here, we've got a similar uh, evaluation of the ADEA in terms of whether or not an organization has violated this statute. You still use the uh, McDonnell-Douglas test. So here, the applicant, the, the plaintiff needs to show that the applicant was a member of a protected class, Here's someone over the age of 40 that the applicant applied for a job in which an employee was, or in which an employer was seeking applicants. The applicant was qualified to perform the job, and despite possessing those qualifications, the applicant was not hired. And after the applicant was denied that position, the employer continued to seek applicants with similar qualifications, except that age was the difference. So here are some examples of discrimination. Forcing someone to retire due to their age, uh, hiring a young worker over a better qualified or older worker, and the textbook points out that 
oftentimes older workers are better uh, employees because they have a higher work ethic. So courts in an ADEA uh, case will usually provide that same analysis, which I just said, with the burden, with the, you know, once the plaintiff provides the prima facie case, the burden shifts to the defendant. And if the defendant can provide some sort of BFOQ, then the, shift, the burden would shift back to the plaintiff to show its pretext. Um, we move now to disability discrimination. And this is important because, like I said once again, about 21% of the United States workforce has a qualified disability. And throughout the last 40 years or so, the federal government has continued to show that it is vested in protecting individuals with disabilities due to the initial creation of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act and then the 1990 Americans with Disability Act and then the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act in 2008. Um, and the reason why these different statutes came out is because the court system started to chip away at the protections of people with disabilities. And so the reauthorization of the ADA is showing that the legislatures are trumping the, the courts and their decisions to, um, to uh, bite, eat away at the ADA. So the elements of the claim here are fairly straightforward. There's a show, there's, it needs to be a showing that the plaintiff has a qualified disability, which is something that limits a major life activity. So that could be any physical impairment, uh, motor control issues. Uh, ver, uh, it could be verbal issues. It could be a mental di uh, disability, a, men a psychological disorder, or an infectious disease. And that the plaintiff uh, is limited by some sort of major life activity such as uh, usually it could be something that is a fundamental aspect of human life, such as caring for, for oneself or hearing or eating or sleeping or standing or walking. And then the plan needs to show that he, was, he or she was discriminated against on the basis of that disability and that no reasonable accommodation was made. So when we talk about... Um, reasonable accommodation. That is basically um, the employer going out of their way to provide some sort of um, change to the job, such as changing the work environment in a way that does not actually change, that does not completely um, change the functions of the job. So we have an example of this that played out last year where Steve Sarkeesian, who was the head coach of the University of Southern California, he was first put on administrative leave and then subsequently fired by USC's athletic director because of uh, allegations that Sarkeesian breached his contract uh, due to his alcoholism. But then Sarkeesian actually... Uh, ended up claiming that alcoholism was a disability and that instead of receiving a reasonable accommodation, he was fired. So we have an example. Sarkeesian filed his complaint against USC last December. And as you can see, we go down to page 24. And this is on, on Blackboard if you want to take a look at it. It shows, that's not what I want, that's not helpful at all. So on page 24, it shows that he was covered under uh, the ADA and that he was employed as the head coach of USC football, that he had a qualified disability within the meaning of the law, and that the defendant, USC, knew about his alcoholism. So he's claiming that 
is a qualified disability that limits a substantial li uh, life activity and that he was able to perform the essential duties of his position with a reasonable accommodation. So the words reasonable accommodation are very important because it shows that if USC would have helped to modify his job some way, shape, or form in a, in a manner that would not actually alter the essential duties he had, that he could perform them adequately, but they instead actually chose to unlawfully fire him. So this is a sticky situation for USC. Now, um, usually a reasonable accommodation is a situation where the employer spends a little bit of money to make it so that the employee, the employee can perform his or her job. So one example is um, if a person works in a factory and they're deaf um, and they have to, and usually there would be some sort of noise that would trigger the, the employee that, to start his or her job with the assembly line by installing a light that would flash every time they need to start, start their job, that would be a reasonable accommodation. Or a more uh, even cheaper situation might be, let's say that a person has a disability that prevents them from going upstairs and the employer says, well, we need to retrofit the building with an elevator and it's too expensive, we can't hire this person because they have a, you know, their office is on the second floor. A reasonable accommodation would be just to make sure that their office is on the first floor and they don't need to go to the second floor. So that would be a, a pretty cost-effective reasonable accommodation. So in terms of what you need to understand as sport managers um, to be successful and to continue to prove your wealth or your, um, your worth to the organization, you need to make sure that you understand all of the applicable uh, materials that are related to the ADA. And then also, when you're, ref when you're reviewing applications uh, for new hires or interview questions, you need to make sure that you don't throw out and don't have inappropriate questions that you ask the employees. You also need to make sure that your pool of applicants is diverse so that you have uh, representative uh, elements uh, of the population. You need to make sure that um, hiring goals are not strictly stated in a way that limits the amount of um, potential employees. And you need to make sure that all policies are not unfairly applied to some employees. There needs to be uh, equitable application so that there's not disparate impact. So employers also need to understand that reasonable accommodations should be made with people with disabilities so long as it's not unduly burdensome, meaning that it's not too expensive for the organization to actually do. Um, and you need to make sure that you avoid interview questions that have potentially discriminatory sort of implications. So some examples of inappropriate, inappropriate um, questions to ask potential employees are, generally speaking, are you over the age of 18? Can you furnish proof of age? Not okay is how old are you? Because that could create the inference that you are going to not hire someone or there's going to be an adverse employment action based off of their age. And if they're over 40, that creates protection under the ADA and potential violation of that statute. Um, questions related to disabilities are not okay. And as well as family status, you need to make sure that you're not saying something that would, um, that would potentially um, discriminate them on the basis of gender or uh, race or, or national origin. And then finally, we, talk, we, we bring it back to the uh, discrimination in compensation, the Equal Pay Act. So this falls under Equal Pay Act as well as Title, title Seven and Title Nine because Title Seven says that gender is a protected class and Title Nine is a protect as protection of gender as as um, a protected class. So the key issue in compensation that often comes up in athletics is coaches. Should male and female coaches at the same institution be paid the same amount? 
Well, it's not such a black and white question here. The difference really is in whether or not they're performing the same, um, they're, whether or not they're performing the same uh, duties. So if the male coach is doing more than the female coach, then the male coach may actually be entitled to more money because the jobs job um, calls for different responsibilities. So I know we went through a lot here, and it's your job as sport managers or people working f uh, f f to, that will be working for employers to understand the basics of discrimination and that not uh, that discriminatory reasons for firings or discipline or, or anything of that like cannot be made in the workplace. It will be a violation of discrimination laws pursuant to Title VII. Instead, there needs to be objective and um, objective reasoning on the basis of qualifications. So if you have any other questions, feel free to come by. I'm here to answer your questions. Thanks, and I hope, you get, I hope to see you guys next time.